What's up everyone, this is Peter Moly here and today's topic today is called Exploring the Demographic History of Taino Descendants. Now this conversation is going to be a little different from the other ones that we have here and I highly recommend that you observe this presentation with an open mind and that you think before responding. Okay, this is an area where people get a little emotional but it's important that we examine each aspect so we can understand our position as modern Caribbean descendants. So with that said, we're going to get into this discussion. Taino people as we know today are the conglomeration of indigenous archaic and Arawakan peoples along with other early indigenous groups who migrated to the Caribbean over 7,000 years. The first migrants were said to have arrived from the Yucatan. Recent finds now suggest that they were the second with the first coming from the south. At least four major Arawakan migrations over the last 4,000 years are from the Amazon and Orinoco River basins. The first mixture produced the classic Taino and sub Tainos respectively, which Columbus encountered. The modern Taino or post-classic gave admixture from Asia, Africa, and Europe, giving rise to modern Taino descendants. Okay, so this is an important part that we are going to explain. We will focus on who were the classic and sub-Taino to understand how we as modern Tainos or post-classics are the descendants of both the classic and sub Taino respectively. Okay, now looking at the map again, um, one of the arguments that a lot of people like to make is that, you know, those ancestors from the arrival of, of European contact, that they were mixed with other people. The difference is that they were mixed with other natives. At that point, there were no European or African influence in the Antilles, okay? It was only native, and that's coming from um, archaic groups and also Arawak groups. By the time that Columbus arrived, the Caribbean was mostly a dominant Arawak society, okay? So just to review this, okay, the first migration uh, it's coming from the south, that's the 5000 BC. Okay, one of the earliest evidence that we have for uh, people in the Caribbean is Banwadi Man in Banwadi Trace in Trinidad. Okay, that's the, that's the earliest trace that we have for uh, man in the Caribbean. Okay, then we have later the 4000 BC, which is the second migration. Okay, and this is um, archaic groups coming from the Yucatan, maybe even some from Florida. Okay, but what started changing everything is the Saladoid migration, 500 BC. And then, not long after, you know, the uh, Carib or the mainland Carina started coming up in the Antilles. Okay, so when you look at these percentages, these percentages reflect admixture after post contact. Okay, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico, those are all former Spanish colonies, whereas Jamaica and Haiti are with former um, British and French colonies. So their demographic history is a little different from ours. Okay, it's very important to understand that. And that will also reflect in how um, Cubans, Dominicans, and Puerto Ricans are greatly different from Haitians and Jamaicans, okay? This is not a biased statement. This is all due to DNA studies, okay? Which some people have a lot of trouble of accepting, okay? DNA has bridged a lot of gaps that ethnohistory and anthropology cannot fill in. So, you know, DNA does help us to get more insight.
The earliest direct evidence on human occupation on the island is dated to 8,000 YBP, that's years before present, with the remains of the Banwadi culture representing the earliest of human occupation on any Caribbean island. Currently, a admixture of populations of European, African, and Native American ancestry characterizes the islands of the Greater and Lesser Antilles. Now this right here is from um, 23andMe. Now as a disclaimer, this, this right here is solely for educational resource only. Okay? So right here, 23andMe, they give like a, a rough view of the islands of the Greater Antilles and that will reflect to Puerto Rico, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, and Jamaica. Okay? And as you can see, Haiti and Jamaica greatly differ from Cuba, DR, and Puerto Rico, okay? Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico, you can see they have a substantial portion of Native American ancestry, whereas in Jamaica, in the Maroon community, um, it would be smaller and Haiti would be uh, almost completely absent, okay, according to studies, all right? 23 in Nice, it says, um, customers from the Caribbean typically have evidence of Southern European, West African, or Native American ancestry in their DNA. Extensive mixing of these historically separate populations a process called admixture resulted in new genetic and cultural identities, identities that define the region today. Customers from Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic genetically have a combination of all three ancestral populations, while customers from Haiti, Jamaica, or Grenada have much higher proportions of West African ancestry with negligible evidence of any indigenous generic, genetic heritage. And again, this is due because um, the demographic history, apart from Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and Cuba, is different because, once again, um, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico, they are all former Spanish colonies. So that's why we have a substantial amount of all three. Uh, the native, the European, and the African. Post-classic Tainos are the genetic descendants of pre-Columbian peoples, as well as people of European and African descent through the recent 500 years of migration to the islands. Okay, so you hear, you see here, um, I showed this before in the last presentation that I did, okay? So you guys kind of have an idea, right? So this is roughly a roundabout in how the sub and the classic Taino appear, okay? So this is, check this out, okay? <clears throat> You see this phenotype here, this um, represents for Arawak groups, all right? And this I took directly from humanphenotypes.net. Native American type of the tropical lowland forest of South America, developed in the Guyana savannas from a proto mongoloid stock that had migrated south coming from the Berlin Strait later expanded all over Amazonia, modern Brazil, and the Caribbean, where it was the dominant type during pre-Columbian periods. So this is something very important to know. So at the time of European arrival, when Columbus arrived into the Caribbean, okay, this was the dominant type in the Antilles, okay, according to humanphenotypes.net. Populations admix after contact with Europeans, 
but several Amazonian tribes remain today. West Amazonoid. Amazonoid subtype, the most frequent type in the Western Amazon rainforest, common among Arawakan speakers. Okay? So, this is a rough estimate in how um, sub Tainos and classic Tainos appear because they were mainly Arawak groups. Okay? This is another example. This is an example of an Arawak phenotype and a mainland Karina phenotype, which in through the chronicles, okay, they were called Carib. The word Carib, when you look at in uh, Guyana, South America, they were called Kalibi. So that's the root of the word Carib, Kalibi, okay, it's from the mainland Karina, all right? But we could explore more in regards to that word in another discussion. Okay, so this is very important to know. Okay, an example of Alwak and an example of Karina. Okay, now when you study the Chronicles, the Alwaks and the Karina, they heavily interacted with each other. Okay. One example is with the Kalinago as the the Kalinago, they're a mixture of the mainland Karina with uh, uh, Arawak speakers from the Lesser Antilles, the Yeti. Okay? And we also have examples in the Greater Antilles, for example, in Puerto Rico, okay, or Borinquen with Awebana's name. Awebana sounds like an obvious Kalinago name. So, you know, there's many things that gives us the motivation to look deeper. Okay, so now we're going to get into who are the post-classic Tainos. Now again, we have to look at this with an open mind. Okay, here you see phenotypes for Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, and Cubans. Okay, and you can see that they are roughly very close to each other. That is because our demographic history, okay? Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and Cuba were all former Spanish colonies, okay? And this is why through DNA testing, especially the recent one, as late as 2017, you see that, you know, we each have a uh, substantial Native American ancestry with Puerto Rico having the most you know, within the Puerto Rican population in that island, okay? So that's something that's very important to know, okay? It has nothing to do with being anti-black and all that stuff. It is simply because our demographic history is greatly different. That's why, you know, we are different from a lot of people in the Caribbean, okay? And then, that has to be duly noted. Moving on. Okay, here's an example of average Jamaican phenotype and an average Haitian phenotype. Okay, uh, predominantly they have a high amount of African ancestry. That's because, um, once again, their demographic history was greatly different from ours. So that's why they would have more. Um, African ancestry, okay? And it's important that we examine, you know, these periods in history that have to happen after post-contact because it does greatly reflect on how um, the cultural demographic changes on the islands. Here is another example with a phenotype with an average Dominican and an average Haitian. Again, this does not have to do with racism, okay? What this has to do is our demographic history is greatly different, okay? Uh, we Dominicans, we are an admixed people. We are a tripod people, okay? Because 
you know, we have in us the Native American, we have the European, and we have the African in us, and that reflects today in our culture. When you study our demographic history, it greatly reflects that. Moving on. Here you see um, percentages in the DR, okay? This is recent, 2017, okay? Uh, various places in the DR where people were tested, okay? And they have a substantial Native American ancestry. Some places higher than others, but we still have it. Okay, another part here is the differential distribution of Taino, African, and European mitochondrial DNA in the Greater Antilles. Now, I emphasize it this way so you guys can clearly understand, okay, the difference between all four islands, okay? You see Cuba, Haiti, sorry, you see Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico have a similar pattern, okay? We have substantial evidence of all three in our DNA. And again, that is because, you know, our demographic heritage, okay? Our demographic heritage reflects why we have all three in our DNA. Okay? Here you see another example of the same uh, template that I just showed, okay, and this is the full template from the 2017 studies. On top is uh, the haplogroups for African lineages, and at the bottom is the percentages for uh, the African, Native American, and the European, okay. Now, again, recent studies shows in regards to Jamaica and Haiti, um, they have the highest amount of um, African in their DNA, and that is greatly to, you know, their demographic history being different from the other three of the islands, you know, which include a portion of Hispaniola or the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and also Cuba, okay? And now we're going to get into historical points, all right? Uh, a great mistake that people do, they say, you know, oh, we shouldn't trust uh, the Chronicles, or we shouldn't trust Columbus, okay? No, there was no one else, there's no evidence of anybody else coming before Columbus, okay? So, somebody like Columbus is a good primary source because he gives a direct account of the people that he saw. Okay, so now we're going to examine some points. Uh, the first is from Columbus' first voyage. Okay, and this is how he describes the natives. They were very well built with handsome bodies and very good faces. Their hair was almost as coarse as horses' tail and short, and they wore it over their eyebrows except a small quantity behind, which they wear long and never cut. Some paint themselves blackish, and they are of the color of the inhabitants of the counties neither black nor white, and some paint themselves white, some red, and some whatever color they find, and some paint their faces, some all their body, some only the eyes, and some only the nose. Next. In Columbus' first voyage, okay, Saturday, October 13th, he says, very handsome people with their hair not curly but straight and coarse like horses' hair. Okay? So he's describing island Arawak people in the Antilles. Okay?
the Journal of Columbus Third Voyage, and that he thought to investigate the report of the Indians of Hispaniola who said that they had come to Hispaniola from the south and the southeast, a black people who have their spears made of a metal which they call one in. Now, a lot of Afrocentrics like to misinterpret this for Africans being the Antilles before Columbus, okay? This passage often gets misinterpreted. It's not that. Most likely what Columbus was describing was Kalinago speakers, which in the Chronicles they are referred to as Caribs, okay? And the Wanins, the Wanins did not come from Africa. The Wanins came directly from South America. Okay? One of the great examples that we have of this is um, the rift between Tainos and Kalinagos that they had. And uh, as Jerry su suggested, part of this is due uh, to the rifts that they possibly could have had in regards of control of these trade routes back and forth from the Antilles to the mainland, okay, in South America. Okay, the letter of Christopher Columbus. He says, I did not find as some of us had expected any cannibals among them, but on the contrary, men of great difference and kindness, kindness, Neither are they black like Ethiopians. Their hair is smooth and straight, for they do not dwell where the rays of the sun strike most vividly. In these islands, I have so far found no human monstrosities, as many expected. But on the contrary, the whole population is very well tried, nor are they Negroes as in Guinea. But their hair is flowing and they are not born where there is intense force in the rays of the sun. Okay, this is an important point. So, directly from Columbus' writings, we are getting an account in how those people prior to contact appeared. Okay, and as I showed earlier, they correspond to Arawak speakers that came from the south. Okay. If you look at what uh, the statement says from humanphenotypes.net. Okay, Las Casas on Columbus description. In short, everything was taken and given of what they had of goodwill. But it seems to me that they were very poor people of everything. They are all naked as their mother bore them, and also the women, although they do not see more than one very young. And all the ones that I saw were young men that none of them saw 30 years old. Very well made, very beautiful, and very good faces. Thick hair, and almost as horses tail. Silks and short hair bring over their eyebrows, except a few behind that they bring long, they never cut, okay? So Las Casas is, is given the same testimonial as Columbus. Moving on. Chaka. The night the admiral, the admiral resolved that some of the men should land at break of the day in order to confer with the natives and learn what sort of people they were. Although it was suspected from the appearance of these who fled at our approach that they were naked, like the admiral had seen in his former voyage. The difference between these Caribs and the other natives with respect to dress consists in their wearing their hair very long, while the latter have it clipped and paint their heads with crosses and a hundred thousand different devices each according to his fancy, which they do with their sharpened reeds. All of them, both Caribs and others, and the others, are beardless, 
so that it is a rare thing to find a man with a beard, okay? This is another testimonial in how those people prior to contact appeared. Okay, this is from Oviedo. He says, the people of this island are dark brown and the same stature and form as I said were the Indians of Hispaniola. They are swift and well disposed for land and sea. Although those from, from San Juan, okay, which was also called Puerto Rico, and the original name we know is Borinquen, okay, Oviedo, he says, are braver or more warlike. They also go about naked. Okay, this is now from Peter Martier. In the course of their explorations of this country, the Spanish perceived in the distance a large house which they approached, persuaded that it was the retreat of Bocano Warish. They are met by a man with a wrinkled forehead and frowning brows, who was escorted by about a hundred warriors armed with bows and arrows pointed lances and clubs. He advanced menacingly towards them. Tainos, they cried, that is to say good men, not cannibals, in response to our signs. They dropped their arms and modified their ferocious attitude. Okay? Now, this is another primary account, but here, as we can see, as uh, Las Casas state they were, the Spanish were only interested in commands so now with the data that we have now on the language of the Greater Antilles with the cross comparisons that we know Taino doesn't mean good so when we look at this account we can understand that you know the Tainos are trying to ask are you relatives or are you relations okay as we know Tai, Itai, and Irai all has to do with blood, okay? Here is another example, okay, how of a rough estimate in how those ancestors look, okay, during contact. As we can see, they correspond with the Yanomamo, okay? The Yanomamo, um, roughly, you know, they're pretty they look pretty close to our walking speakers, okay? So this is another good example to use to get a visual. Again, at that point when Columbus arrived into the Caribbean, okay, there was no European influence and there was no African influence, okay? So at that point when Columbus arrived, there was no admixture of the European and the African, okay? that came later, post-contact, okay? Post-contact gave rise to Dominicans, Cubans, and Puerto Ricans, okay? Here is another point from Oviedo. By every means at my disposal, from the time I came out to these Indians, I have tried with much earn, earnest to learn both in these islands how the Indians recall the matters of their origin and ancestors and whether they have books or by what signs and symbols they guard the memory of the past. And on this island, as far as I have been able to find out, their, their chants which they call aritos are their only books or memorials to pass from person to person, from father to sons, from present to future generations, as will be explained here. So getting back into the subject, this way of singing is in these islands a representation of history or a recall of things past, both war and peace. For in the continuity of these chants, Neither are the great deeds nor events which have taken place forgotten. 
and they preserve these chants in their memories rather than in recorded books. This is very important. And in this fashion, they recite the genealogies of their chiefs and kings and lords and the works which they have performed and the good and the bad seasons they have that have befallen them and other matters which they want young and old to know and be very familiar with and have firmly carved in their memories and to this end they keep on with aritos especially to commemorate the famous victories in battle Okay, this other point on the Edito I'm going to give from Peter Martier. Okay, he says, and this is, you can find it directly in his Decadas book, in his Decadas 7, book 10. Okay, that's where you can find it. Decadas 7, book 10. Okay, Peter Martier, he, he says, while these ceremonies were being performed, in the vestibule of the drum and cacique, the women were busy in another room preparing cakes to be offered in sacrifice. In response to a signal given by the bojiques, the women entered in position, chanting the hums they called aritos, and carrying the cakes in artistically woven baskets. They wore garlands of different flowers and upon entering, they marched round the group of, of the seated men. The latter sprang to their feet and together with the women exalted in their aretos the power of their semis, commemorating in song the great deeds of their caciques ancestors. Okay, so this is the point, important point to note. Uh, the Aritos has to do with uh, songs, okay? And we know that Arawakan speakers are mostly an oral speaking people, okay? They didn't have books. They remember and recall things by songs, by chanting, okay? And when you look at other southern tribe, tribes, okay, in the Amazonian region, this is the things that they do, okay? So this is another good point to compare. Now, when we look at another point that Avito says, he says, and so in this way of singing, in this and on the other islands, the Arito is an effigy of history or agreement of the things past and of wars, because with the continuation of such songs, they do not forget the feats and the events that have happened. This is very important, okay? And with this understanding, we know that this is how the language has survived in the Antilles, okay? Now, the difference from this today, um, the Garifuna, okay, they are the only people today that are the custodians of an island Arawak language, okay? As they are the only community that, that, carry, that carry on that linguistic legacy. As you see here with the petroglyphs that's found all throughout the Caribbean, okay, um, one of the tragedy is, you know, when it comes to understanding uh, the Taino, you know, the Spanish, they weren't really interested in, you know, learning in depth. What they wanted to, to learn was enough so that they could exploit the resources on the island. This is a tra traversity of trying to understand uh, the Taino. And part of that is comes with uh, trying to interpret uh, the Taino petroglyphs, okay, because that oral history that was related with the Taino, um, you could say, is, is lost in time, okay? Um, because we don't have uh, a living Taino speaker from the contact days 
who you know was able to pass down uh, this information with interpreting Taino petroglyphs. Okay, uh, various scholars like Jose R. Oliver, okay, Basil A. Reed, uh, Samuel M. Wilson. They all, even uh, Re uh, Ricardo Alaglia, okay, they all give good attempts in trying to um, interpret, you know, Taino petroglyphs and Taino culture. Okay, and this is why that um, we go and compare because this is the only way that we can try to get some sort of roundabout guess or insight of what uh, these symbols represent. Okay, they greatly differ from um, Mayan writings and petroglyphs because you know those were two greatly different societies. Okay, when you study the chronicles, um, starting with Columbus to Las Casas, Oviedo, Peter Martier, okay, we all see examples of Arawak in the Antilles, and this we know from looking at toponyms, um, looking at uh, individual words, okay. Um, and other stuff, you know, that can be traced, you know. Uh, we have a lot of data in the Antilles that can be traced to South America, okay. As Granbury and Vasilius state that the Taino has a northern Arawak root. Okay, and an important point from Las Casas Historia de las Indias, okay. Las Casas suggests that the importation of African slaves in so doing that the natives of Hispaniola can have their freedom. Later, Las Casas regrets this as he writes it was no better than Indian slavery. Okay? So this is the point where the African starts to become an influence in the Antilles. Okay? And this is the documented by Las Casas. Of the Spaniards from this island, they said, the clergyman Las Casas, seeing that he intended and that the religious of uh, Santo Domingo did not want to absolve those who had Indians, if they did not leave them, that if it brought them a license of the king so that they could bring a dozen from castle of black slaves who would open the hands of the Indians, remembering the clergyman said in his memorials that he should do thanks to the neighboring Spaniards to give them a license to bring from Spain a dozen more or less of black slaves. Okay, now these are enslaved Africans. Okay, let's get to the point. Because with them, they would sustain themselves on earth and leave free the Indians. This warning that license was given to bring black slaves to these islands gave first Las Casas. Okay? Las Casas was the first to initiate this in the Antilles. Okay? As he writes in his history. Okay? Las Casas did not notice the injustice with the Portuguese take them and make slaves, which after that fell on it, did not give because they there was in, in the world. Because he always considered them unjust and tyranny, and tyrannically made slaves because the same reason is of them, of the Indians, okay? Now he's just trying to justify um, African slavery because of the uh, native, okay? So this we can understand what point that he's getting to, but let's let's go on. They responded to these four islands, okay? And this is the islands that I was talking about earlier in the beginning of this presentation. Hispaniola, which today is the divided between Haiti and the Dominican Republic, San Juan, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Jamaica. 
it was in his opinion that at present 4,000 slaves would be enough blacks just as this response came. There was no lack of who from the Spaniards from winning thanks gave the notice to the governor of Baressa. This mercy was very harmful for the good of the population of these islands because the notice of the blacks the clergyman Las Casas had given was for the common good of the Spaniards, okay? So the reason why did I put this is so people can get a rough draft in where uh, the European and the African came in, okay? Since the beginning of the slave trade in 1525 to its cessation in 1866, about 730,000 Africans were forcibly transported to Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Dominican Republic. Okay, now here are some closing points. There were no Taino people. There were tribes in the Antilles who spoke Arawak. Some spoke a mixed dialect, some with the southern, some with the northern, some with the eastern, some with the western. When the early Central Americans arrived into the, Ar in, into the Antilles, okay, and this is uh, mainly archaic groups, early archaic groups, okay, Southern Americans absorbed them. When you examine the linguistic evidence in the Antilles, we can see that uh, the island Arawak in the Antilles were mostly dominant, okay? This is the most that we see. We see evidence of Arawak speaking people in the Antilles. Early Central Americans got Arawakanized. They were on the verge of becoming a nation, but ultimately it was stopped. So the point where Columbus makes his arrival in the Antilles, um, that's where the evolution of the Taino comes to a halt because now they go through a new cycle, okay? They go through admixture with Europeans and later Africans, okay? And that later gave rise to the demographic that we have today in the Caribbean islands. This is, a, this is the tra traversity of colon colonization and the early contact period. They were on their way to a Mayan style slash Aztec civilization. By the time the Spanish arrived, they didn't get there, okay? They were moving towards complex societies. And with that said, that's the end of my presentation. Again, you have to look at these points with an open mind because this is where a lot of rifts come in because um, people don't want to take the time to study about DNA. DNA can tell you a lot about your ancestry, okay, uh, where you come from and the history of your family, okay, and the great examples are with the islands that our families come from, okay, whether it would be Jamaica, Cuba, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico, okay. Now, this presentation is reflecting on the islands of the Greater Antilles, and this can also um, reflect with the islands of the Bahamas, okay? Now, with studying um, the history of the, of the Antilles from the early chroniclers, along with archaeology, and along with uh, the DNA evidence, you know, all, studying all those things together, as well as the linguistic part, it should give you a grounded understanding of 
culture of your cultural identity, okay? And with this also as well, uh, this is help to encourage a balanced social consciousness between uh, the Taino, the European, and the African ancestry, okay? Because we cannot venerate more one more than the other because we still have other two genetic ancestry that is a part of our bloodline that we cannot disregard. We can be activists as modern culturalists, but it's important that we must take the time to understand each part that makes us. So this is my presentation for today. I hope you take this opportunity to go further and do your own studies yourself and take the time to understand first because when it comes to this, people make the mistake of, of responding fast and heated arguments before trying to understand what's being said, okay? And we have to look at this realistically. And uh, with this today, this is an example that we show um, to help give a realistic approach in understanding why we are Taino descendants. So this is my presentation today and until the next discussion.